Let's do chapter 11 of Streams to the River, River to the Sea. It did not take long for the wedding, not as it did at home. At home, when my brother Kamiyawait was married, it took two moons just to get ready. It was this way. My brother talked to my father and told him that he wished to be married. My father thought Kamiyawait was old enough to think straight, so he said, go and get married. But this did not happen right away. First, my mother and father went to talk to the family of the girl my brother had chosen. They took nice presents, an antelope blanket, a tanned buffalo hide, and a white horse with a saddle. But they did not give the presents to the family at once, so that it would be a surprise they left them outside for the family to find after they had gone. They talked to the girl's mother and father for a long time. Just before they left, they said that their son wished to marry. This was good, her family said. And then they told the girl about everything. Since she had been sitting in the teepee all this time, she had made up her mind already. Had she not liked my brother, her family would have given the presents back. But she did like him. So for days, her family gathered up presents of their own, better than the ones they had received, such as two horses instead of one. And the girl put on her finest clothes, and they all rode off to our teepee. My sister and I went out to greet them, and my father and mother took the girl inside. <clears throat> From that moment, she was married to my brother. There were no meetings about me and Toussaint Charbonneau, no friendly talks, and no nice presents from one family to another. As Blue Sky had decreed, Toussaint Charbonneau and I were married six days later before a fire in the lodge she had built for us. She was at the wedding, but Red Hawk and Black Moccasin were not. Charbonneau's first wife had a pot of deer meat cooking over the fire. She served it with squamash roots cooked in the ashes and a hot drink that tasted like honey. While she passed these things around, she smiled a lot, although she must have been unhappy. She was not unhappy for long. Two days later, she and Charbonneau left to trade at La Borne's village. I helped carry her things down to the canoe. Charbonneau picked me up and whirled me around like a doll. You careful now, you careful tomorrow too, he said, and rubbed his hairy face against my cheek. Otter woman shyly touched me. In signs, she made me see what she thought. She thought it was better to have a half part in a good man than a full part in a bad man. I watched them go up the river. I felt nothing. The next day, Blue Sky asked me to come to the lodge and live there while they were gone. It is warm in the lodge, she said. You will not cook just for yourself and eat alone. You will have company. Alone, the nights are long. I will come every day and eat. I was only making a joke with her. I had married Toussaint Charbonneau. By the laws of the Minotaurs, I was his wife. It was a burden set down upon my shoulders by my guardian spirit. It was placed there against my will and all my wishes, yet the burden was mine. I had a big supply of wood for a fire and dried meat and corn for food. Also four deer skins and a long piece of sinew. <clears throat> I spent the days making a pair of moccasins and a mantle to take the place of the one I had worn out. The moccasins were useful when I had to go out to see blue sky. I told her what was happening to me, how different I felt sometimes. She made me lie down on her bed. She felt my stomach up and down, round and round. Then she laughed. You will be a mother one of these times, she said. When? Soon enough. When the snow comes? After. How much, I asked, beginning to shake. This many moons, she said, and held up a lot of fingers. <laughs> what shall I do? You go and get your things and bring them here and sit down and make clothes for the baby. You will need a cradle too, but that can wait until we find a cedar tree to cut down. Boy, dark is a good wood also, but it does not grow on the river. I wanted to stay in my place where I had been living happily enough but Blue Sky made me move back to the big lodge. I moved that day. By nightfall, she had me sorting out squirrel skins to make a blanket. A few suns later, two men brought a small cedar, which they split into three pieces for me to work on. I had never made a baby's cradle or watched someone else make one, so Blue Sky had to show me how. 
she gave me a sharp knife that she had gotten from Charbonneau one time and set me to whittling the boards, which were the length of my arms and the span of one hand in width. Cedar is a soft wood to touch, yet it is strong. My whittling dragged along, though the knife was sharp, and she made me throw away one of the pieces. It looks fine to me, I protested. To me, it looks crooked, she said. It will make a crooked cradle and a child with crooked legs. When I lived in a cradle, I told her, it was just a tube of buffalo hide. I liked it very much. I liked it so much that when my mother took me out, I always cried. Blue Sky said, there will be many moons before you need the cradle. Work on other things for your baby. A squirrel blanket, moccasins with fur on the inside, two plain, two with feathers for dress up, and a cap that pulls down over the ears, and a deer bone rattle, big so it cannot be swallowed, only chewed upon. Ah, uh, I was ashamed, but I did not take her advice. Stubbornly, I went on with the cradle. I threw away the crooked piece and whittled a good one. When I had three shapely pieces, I bent a curved piece of tough hide across the tops, holding them tightly together. I made a bag of soft deer skin and stretched it down over the curved hide and the three pieces of cedar and tied it at the bottom. I lined the cradle with soft rabbit fur. Good, Blue Sky said, holding the cradle up and turning it around. The rawhide hood at the top is curved well. It is also strong. If the cradle falls when you hang it up, it will roll around on the ground. I did not need her advice for the decorations. I had made all kinds of decorations when I was a child. She gave me a bag of porcupine quills. I chose four of the longest and soaked them in water from one day to the next. I put them between my front teeth, clamped down hard and pulled them flat as a ribbon. These I sewed on the hood of the cradle, two on one side and two on the other. Between the four black and white quills, I painted a picture of the evening star with white clouds. Beautiful, Blue Sky said. It's an omen. You will have a beautiful child. You are beautiful, and Toussaint Charbonneau is ugly. But still, you'll have a beautiful child. When? Soon. Will my guardian spirit tell me when? Yes. She will speak loudly in your ear, in both of your ears. She will speak to you in a clear voice. It is not an ache in the head. It is not a pain in the tooth, this child thing. What will Toussaint Charbonneau say when he comes back and sees me walking around fat? If I know this man, he will stare at you, pull at that hair on his chin and grunt. <clears throat> he will say, how can Charbonneau go trading up and down the river with a baby in a cradle board hanging by his wife's neck? Her words came true. When he did come back late in the autumn, that is what he did and what he said to me. He also said more. We were in the lodge and Blue Sky was helping me make another pair of moccasins, these of soft antelope skin. He stared at me. He shook his head. He squinted through his locks of hair. Charbonneau go far, he said. Big town, St. Louis, sell much, buy much. Come here, see boy, Ay ay. A girl maybe, Blue Sky said, a pretty one. Pretty girl, ugly girl, both bad, Charbonneau said. Boy, name Jean-Baptiste. Otter woman said, call him Brave Raven. My father's name is Brave Raven. He gave her a hard look and said, Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. And that's the end of chapter 11. I hope you liked it. Bye-bye.